Good morning, everyone. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our speakers this morning. Today, our speakers will be Dr. Robert Ford and Dan Braga. Dr. Robert Ford will share the knowledge he has gained in over 35 years of experience and through involvement in no fewer than 500 clinical trials. Dr. Ford was an author of the Response Evaluation Criteria of Solid Tumors, or RESIS 1.1 an internationally accepted response criteria that is used to standardize patient response to therapy. Throughout his career, he has also worked with the US FDA and several top tier pharmaceutical companies. In 1988, Dr. Ford joined Princeton Radiology Associates and 10 years later founded RADFARM, an imaging core lab dedicated to the independent review of diagnostic imaging studies. In 2014, Dr. Ford founded Clinical Trials Imaging Consulting a consulting company specializing in providing consulting services in the area of medical imaging and clinical trials to the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry. Our second speaker today is Dan Braga, the principal for medical imaging solutions at Medidata Solutions. Dan works with sponsors, CROs, core labs, and sites to adopt medical image technology to help automate image acquisition, distribution, assessment, and data collection. Prior to Medidata, Dan was one of the co-founders of Intellimage, a medical image management and workflow company later acquired by Medidata. Prior to Intellimage, Dan worked in various product management, operational, and sales roles with healthcare technology companies such as GE Healthcare, PocketScript, and WebMD. Today, Dr. Ford and Dan will discuss best practices in the use of medical images in clinical trials. They will discuss key considerations when utilizing medical images in clinical trials, as well as how to overcome top challenges that can introduce time, cost, or risk to the clinical trial. Once again, please note we'll be holding questions at the end of both talks. Also, please remember to use the Q&A portal, not chat functions for questions. Without further ado, I'd like to kick off the webinar by introducing Dr. Ford. Dr. Ford? Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction and to all of you attendees for logging in and for giving me the opportunity to present this uh, material. Uh, the topic that I'd like to present today is imaging issues in phase two and three global trials using my experience in oncology as a focus or prototype uh, for the discussion. Well, this is the standard workflow that exists with an oncology study that is using imaging-based response criteria such as RESIST or RENO or others to support imaging-based endpoints such as progression-free survival, overall response rate, uh, disease-free survival, wh whatever the imaging-based endpoint happens to be. And as we all know, the process typically starts with the sponsor that has a hypothesis to be tested, uh, so the sponsor writes a protocol. Uh, the sponsor enlists investigators to enroll the subjects into the trial. In this case, it's an oncology study, but the same workflow can apply to other indications where ancillary testing is performed to support the endpoints. So for example, if this was an asthma study, the ancillary testing may be pulmonary function testing in place of the uh, medical images. Or if it's a cardiac study, it may potentially be EKGs or uh, echoes in place of the oncology study. But essentially, the workflow is very similar. Subjects are then sent by the investigators to these labs to have ancillary tests performed and specifically in the case of the oncology study, the subjects are sent to imaging facilities to have their CT scans or MRIs or PET CTs, you know, whatever imaging study is being used to assess status of the disease. The imaging studies are performed and the on-site physician generates a report uh, that gets sent back to the referring physician. The referring physician then uses the information in the report to complete generally the much more detailed case report form that's been designed by the sponsor to capture the information required by the sponsor to generate the results to support the endpoints. The sponsor then builds, cleans, and validates a database, performs the statistical analysis, and hopefully uh, uses the results in support of an application uh, for an approval. So again, this is the process for oncology studies where the ancillary testing happens to be imaging but the workflow remains very similar for other indications that use similar type of ancillary testing. 
Well, within this oncology workflow, there are imaging core labs that insinuate themselves in the process and provide oversight at various levels. So for example, they train the investigators as to what exam should be done and how the exam should be sent to the imaging core lab for review. They train the imaging facilities how to properly perform the exams specific to the protocol requirements. You know, some exams are easy to perform and others are a bit more complicated. Uh, the images are sent to the imaging core lab where they are checked to see if they meet the protocol requirements. You know, the core labs iterate with the sites to correct the issues. Core labs also train the readers. That is, at the core labs, the images are read by a smaller number of readers according to a charter. There's an overriding quality process and reader performance is monitored. That is sent to the sponsor and the regulatory agencies for comparison. So similarly, there are other core labs. There's cardiac core labs, pulmonary core labs, all which perform the same type of quality control of this ancillary testing for their respective indications, similar to what imaging core labs perform for imaging studies. Now, so we have an imaging core lab reviewing radiology studies when they arrive at the core lab. So let's take a look at a snapshot of data that represents findings after the images are checked to be sure that the images meet certain quality parameters before they are read. If they fail image quality assurance, teams iterate with the sites to correct the issues prior to the images being read. So this is a snapshot of data from 18 months duration across 200 studies. During that time interval, there were 26,000 image quality issues identified which would have prevented those images from being read. And you can see there are various reasons why scans failed IQA. The most common issue was the fact that the images were reconstructed either too small or too large of a slice thickness. This can have effects on the size of the measurable lesions at baseline, the number of images for readers to review, or the image quality because of quantum model. You know, the point being, you know, when you look for these issues, you can find them. You know, these issues would not have been identified unless there was a process in place to identify the issues. And it's always surprising to me, actually, the number of issues. So again, this is a snapshot of data, courtesy of BioClinica, provided over 18 months duration across 200 trials, across 10,600 imaging facilities. And this identifies 26,000 imaging quality issues uh, as a result of that image review process that otherwise may not have existed. Well, we can parse the data to a more detailed level, and you can see that most of the issues deal with CT scanning. You know, in part, this is expected because CT is the most common exam received in oncology studies. However, if you wanted to use the data in a proactive way and spend your resources efficiently, you would likely want to be sure your radiology facilities understood the processes most related to CT. You know, PET imaging is also becoming more prominent. However, it's quite technically demanding. So if your trial includes PET scanning, you know, site training is very important as the PET scans need to be performed identically to be able to compare response time point to time point. There is little tolerance for deviance from the protocol from time point to time point. And if you look at region, or look at the data by region, half of the issues came from sites in Western Europe, and 25% of the sites came from sites in North America. So again, you can use this data to avoid problematic geographic locations if you so choose, or you can use it to proactively spend your training resources in those areas that might be most beneficial. But again, you have to have a process to identify the data to be able to use it accordingly. And you can drill down even further. If you look at the number of issues per site, Western Europe has approximately 2.5 times the number of issues per site as in North America. Uh, again, local on-site monitoring is important for resolving these issues, but again, you have to have the data and able to be able to implement an effective quality process. So why do I talk about these quality issues? Why do I make such a big deal out of them? Well, it's very simple that image quality can affect outcomes. So let me give you an example. So in this table um, at baseline, which is the first column represented by the B, this subject had CT scans of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis with the P representing those scans positive for disease. 
At the first time point, or the second column labeled number one, the down arrow indicates that the amount of disease has improved to the point where the subject would qualify as achieving a partial response. The third column labeled number two has a down arrow in the chest and pelvis because the amount of disease in those locations is improving or getting smaller. However, the CT scan of the abdomen could have been either not done and it's missing or it was done with very poor quality. Unfortunately, in this instance, since we have a site of disease at baseline that was not followed up at a particular time point, uh, then that, um, that time point response then is unable to determine or unable to evaluate. At the third time point, the amount of disease decreases in all three anatomic locations to the point where the patient achieves a PR again as well. Now, if this is a phase two study where you're looking at overall response rate and you're following strict confirmation of response criteria, uh, then it is entirely possible that this interval UE at the second time point does not confirm the immediately prior time point partial response. So in essence then, because of one missing or poor quality exam, you potentially lose or respond. Now I'm overstating this a bit to emphasize the point, the point being that image quality can affect outcome. Um, let me give you another example, and I'm gonna to try to find the pointer here. So this is a bone scan. Bone scans are used to screen for bone metastases. Uh, the way this is done is the uh, tracer gets uh, injected it circulates, it gets taken out of blood by the bones, and then uh, is imaged by a gamma counter, and what you get is a picture that looks like a skeleton. And these areas of hot spots, or these dark areas, represent uh, sites of bone metastases because additional calcium is being laid down in these active bone sites, or sites of bone turnover. So this is an anterior view. It's as if you were looking at a patient looking at you. This picture here is the same picture as this one, only I've turned up the intensity settings to bring out the bone detail to a greater extent. This is the same patient, it's a posterior view, as is if you're looking at the patient from behind and you can see the patient has spinal metastases. This picture is the same as the prior picture, again, only I've turned up the intensity settings to bring out the bone detail. So this is a very good quality bone scan. If we look here, we can see that these bones are uh, much darker and here even darker to a greater extent. Um, this is the posterior view, so this view corresponds to this view, and you can see that the bones look darker. <clears throat> so if this was the baseline and this was the follow-up exam, then you might say the patient is worse. If, if this is the um, follow-up exam and this is the baseline exam, then you might say the patient is uh, better. I'm just being notified here that the pointer is not working, so I'll try to be more specific with respect to the exams. The point here being <clears throat> that when I did this, this is actually the same patient at the same time point at the same scan. And all I did was sit at the camera and change the intensity settings when the scans were produced, similar to the way that you would change the intensity settings or the display on your computer monitor or your, your TV. So again, the point here being that these technical variations can really have an effect on outcome because um, they can really uh, adjust response assessment. And I showed you good quality bone scans earlier. These are examples of poor quality bone scans uh, that were sent in that I had been asked to review at one point in one trial uh, for patients that were on the study. And you can see the two colored pictures in the uh, left upper corner as you look at the, uh, at the images, they're very poor quality. They look nothing like the scans I showed you on the slide before. And the other series of scans are all series uh, of patients that were sent in. So these scans are hard enough to read when they're good quality. When these scans are of poor quality, they are more difficult to read, and therefore they result in greater variability between readers because of subjective interpretation of poor quality scans. So again, the point I'm trying to make here is that the quality of the scans has an impact on the issues. So the initial workflow that I showed you is on the right-hand side of this picture as you look at it. It was the site that does not include, or the workflow that does not include the imaging core lab. And again, when I showed you that workflow, 
I didn't speak at, about the number of quality issues that occurred because with that workflow, we really don't know what the quality uh, of the scans is. The alternate workflow with the Imaging Core Lab providing the over, overview, I was able to define for you the number of quality issues that existed. The point being here, if you don't look, you won't find. In the first workflow, it's not as if the issues aren't present. It's just that we haven't identified a process to identify those issues. So the positive outlook here is that if we have this data, then we can use our resources in an appropriate directed way. We can train to the issues, right? Training is most important and we can potentially improve the outcomes. For example, if we know bone scans will be involved and we know there are prevalent quality issues, we may need to qualify the sites before they are allowed to be enrolled as a site to be certain that they can produce good quality issues, or perhaps based on our data, we only need to qualify search sites for certain exams, phone scans in certain geographic locations. It may be that particular sites need training on certain aspects, such as how to perform CT exams or how to perform PET CT exams, or how to send images electronically as opposed to a courier. And, and while I'm focused on oncology as an example, I'm sure the cardiac, the pulmonary, the photography, the pathology call labs will all tell you similar experiences and concepts. There are also interpretive risks from the review perspective. You know, in, in my experience, there can be differences in subject eligibility assessed by the investigators as opposed to the assessment by the imaging core lab. If an eligibility criterion is measurable disease by resist at baseline, I suspect there will be some subjects who are not eligible on the basis of a retrospective review. Now, a potential way around this is to do an eligibility review at the time enrollment is considered. However, this needs to be done in real time, so you need to have the technical capabilities to accomplish this. You need electronic transfer of images, you need real-time quality assessment, you need distributed remote reading for reader access and availability, and you need rapid reporting capabilities to report the results uh, back to the appropriate location. Um, you should be able to monitor reader performance in an ongoing manner, such that training feedback can be used to identify and address outliers. Uh, informative censoring can be a statistical risk. This can be minimized by confirmation of progression reach, such that when a site believes a subject has progressed, the images are sent in for real-time reads by the imaging core lab to confirm the progression prior to the subject being taken off trial. If this helps to minimize subjects being taken off trial prior to central confirmation of progression. Again, with all of these interpretive risks, there are technical demands to accomplishing this in real time. But again, thinking on the positive side, having this data allows you to implement perhaps risk-based monitoring. Risk-based monitoring examines all areas of a study, people, process, data, and technology with the goal of removing sources of risk or planning for and mitigating the risks that cannot be uh, removed. Uh, the level of monitoring in the given risk is associated with the likelihood of the risk occurring and the impact of that risk occurring. So for the various risks, you can implement a monitoring mechanism to mitigate that risk. However, to do that, you have to have systems that can compile data across multiple activities within the process. And the question really is, can you leverage technology to improve performance? Can some of the metadata solutions perhaps improve performance? For example, uh, can eligibility review be linked to enrollment, randomization, stratification, and supply change management via the balanced randomization and trial supply management solution? Can you integrate clinical data with radiology outcomes data via centralized statistical analytics? Can you manage operational metrics via the clinical trial management system? You know, can you leak site image compliance to reimbursement uh, via the grants manager? Uh, can you do site initiation training and via an operational dashboard using iMetadata and clinical management portals? Can you analyze reader performance metrics via metadata insight? 
and you, can you compile data and improve performance for use in follow-on studies? Um, so in closing, what I've attempted to do is to identify the imaging issues that exist in phase two and three global trials, you know, using oncology as a focus uh, or an example. Try to make the point that I think similar issues likely exist in other therapeutic areas that use ancillary testing in support of endpoints. I've tried to demonstrate the importance of minimizing these issues, perhaps using risk-based monitoring, as these quality issues can certainly affect outcome in radiology. And the, to promote the thought of using technology uh, to improve performance. For forward with one question. Okay. Um, okay. What is your experience with FDA to review images remotely and directly from their systems? Like, what are the current FDA requirements? So uh, years ago, um, we used to actually compile the images on um, external drives and uh, personally deliver to them to the FDA for their review. Um, I, I think that's less of an issue at this point. Is in the recent submissions I've been involved in, uh, we haven't had to send images uh, to the FDA except in one um, recent submission to uh, a European agency, we actually are sending images as part of that submission package. So I don't think it's as a, a predetermined requirement as much currently as it used to be, but the FDA, the regulators always reserve uh, the right to call in whatever information they need to make the decision, and that potentially certainly could be images. You know, it would be ideal if there was a mechanism by which um, a provider could easily provide remote access to an FDA review or should, should the FDA review decide they want to see images. So, you know, for, for a product that has that capability, that would be an, an ideal solution such that the uh, FDA review could easily log in uh, to a site and perform the review remotely as opposed to loading up uh, external drives with images and delivering them uh, locally to the FDA or any regulator. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one more question for you. Sure. Uh, would you please say a few words about the unique challenges of imaging in brain cancer GBM with in-situ therapy and onco-immunotherapeutics? Uh, I missed the first part with, with what type of therapy? I didn't understand that. One second. Um, Unique challenges of imaging in brain cancer GBM mm -hmm. with in situ therapy and onco immunotherapeutics. Well, one thing we certainly know that assessment, you know, glioblastomas grow in a very invasive manner. And um, measurement of complex lesions is always more difficult than measurement of well defined lesions. So, when you look at oval-shaped, rounded, well-defined lesions with high background to lesion conspicuity, reader um, concordance in measurements is much better than when you look at poorly boarded, irregular, complex uh, shaped lesions such as in glioblastoma. So right off the bat, we know that measurement of these lesions is gonna be much more problematic and there will be greater variability between readers who are independently measuring them. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that we have enhancement that we typically use for lesion measurement, but there are other components of glioblastoma, including changes seen on T2 and flare imaging, and, and that has to be incorporated in part of the response assessment, and that has been with the, uh, with the RAINO criteria. Um, ad additionally, it, it is uh, part of the criteria to use some clinical information, steroid dose, as well as neurologic status. So sponsor companies have to realize that they have to collect that information and that has to be integrated. <clears throat> so I think, I think the, the issues are number one, um, measurement variability. Number two, subjective assessment of changes on flare and T2. Um, additionally, some of the drugs affect enhancement uh, so you have to be certain um, that you're not seeing a pseudo response. Um, additionally, uh, some of the drugs will result in pseudo progression. So you have to be certain that you are taking that into consideration in your response criteria. 
Well, one of the questions I frequently get asked is, you know, in terms of read paradigms, um, you know, you can have a single reader paradigm, you can have a two plus one reader paradigm, you can have a two plus one reader paradigm with a clinical oncology review. Um, you know, when are these different read paradigms um, useful? Um, you know, I think that the, 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 by precedent, the two plus one read paradigm is ideal for any studies where um, the data will be used to support a, a submission uh, of an endpoint based on imaging. So in that instance, perhaps a phase two study that may be used for accelerated approval and, and certainly phase three studies where the endpoints are imaging based, um, the two plus one reader paradigm is, uh, is I think by precedent, the most commonly used. Um, <clears throat> What does the two plus one paradigm do for you? Well, I think one of the things it does is that it filters out reader error. Um, you know, you can find the best radiologists um, and everyone at some point makes an error in, in interpretation. And what the two plus one paradigm does, I think it gets you closest to the truth uh, because it filters out those small number uh, of reader errors. Um, so I think that that is probably the most, the most uh, commonly used uh, for regulatory approval. Um, what I'd like to do now is to introduce Dan Braga, who is the principal of the Metadata Medical Imaging System, who will go into more detail specifically uh, about the uh, metadata uh, medical image product uh, that they have. Thank you, Dean. I'm getting started. So I'm going to introduce you today and review some common pain points with medical imaging and clinical trials, as well as how technologies can be used to overcome such pain points and such issues that sp sites, sponsors, Coralize, and CROs commonly run into. Before I began, I thought I'd set the stage with just taking a quick snapshot of the clinical trial in front of today. You can see here there's many manual steps, whether it's the sites actually submitting the data, filling out forms, God forbid if they're still manually shipping CDs and data, there's all the things that can go wrong with that from a site's perspective, as well as things that can go wrong with once the data is received at the core labs. Admin QC in the image, making sure the images follow the right protocol, getting the images inserted into their reading environments or reading tools, and then ultimately completing the assessment and getting that data back to the sponsor and into their systems. So with that being said, I first just wanted to introduce Medidata Medical Imaging. While Medidata, while, while medical imaging is newer to Medidata, the technologies are definitely not. Medidata acquired a company called IntelliMage last year. IntelliMage has been around for nearly 10 years powering medical imaging and clinical trials. Currently, we're processing over 400 million images annually, so lots of data coming through the platform for pharmaceutical and medical device clinical trials, as well as for commercial usage of the technology. So let's take a look at the common medical imaging-related headaches. Number one, manual submissions. If you're still using CDs, there's a lot that can occur with that. We'll take a deeper dive into all five of these headaches here in just a moment. Number two, data entry errors. Similar to entering data into an EDC with medical image submissions, there's still other clinical data that needs to be entered. Lots of headaches that come with that and lots of delays. Number three, and arguably the most um, important, one of the biggest headaches that we hear from the industry are medical images not being identified properly. So the patient information is not being stripped out of the images prior to being submitted. Number four, images that do not meet imaging protocol. We'll talk about that. And then number five, sponsors not having access to data or sponsors imaging data being spread out across multiple core lab or CRO platforms. So let's first take a look at shipping images using CDs. Again, this is decreasing, you know, on an annual basis usage of this, but still being done. Um, number one, much too expensive. You know, the cost for shipping CDs, especially coming from OUS back to the US, but the cost for shipping CDs is just too expensive. Believe it or not, the cost for shipping CDs typically exceeds the cost for using, you know, more advanced electronic image transmission systems. And once the data is arrived, very common thing, broken CDs, damaged CDs, CDs that were scratched, CDs that can't be reviewed. No audit trail. Who had access to the CDs? Who viewed it? just no knowledge of what happens with the images that are on CD once they leave the, uh, the hospital where they were sent from. Then ultimately just delays. So when you get a broken CD, if you get CDs that contain the wrong images, which is very common when you get 
waiting for those images to be reviewed and, and to get that data back. So headache number one, shipping images using CDs. is definitely a big pain point for those that are still doing that. And we see a lot of sponsors that have a mix of this, maybe 70, 80% of their stuff being done electronically with Core Labs that they work with, and this other you know, smaller percentage still being done manually with perhaps smaller Core Labs or individual reviewers that they're working with. Heading number two, data entry errors. I mentioned this before, similar to what you would experience here when entering data into an EDC. Medical imaging uh, submissions also require uh, additional clinical data to be submitted. And how is that data verified? What kind of edit checks are done on that data? If you're submitting that data using paper, then you can imagine there's no edit check capabilities. But even in electronic systems that we've seen out there, there's minimal to no uh, edit check capabilities on the data that you're entering. And that just increases the probability for error and ultimately increases the query rate. Headache number three, and I mentioned this before as being one of the biggest ones, the identification of images. This is tough to do. It's tough to do for hospitals that don't have the capability or that have a, a very disjointed you know, capability to remove the PHI from images before they submit them to wherever they're going. Sometimes hospitals are asked to de-identify data before they electronically submit the images to a core lab, depending on what system they have. Other times they're asked to de-identify de the images before they burn them to CD. Well, it's just a very timely and difficult task to do. And oftentimes they have the capability, but they just don't remove all the data that needs to be removed. So high percentages of images are being received that still contain PHI. Maybe they removed the patient's name, but didn't remove other data points contained within those images that needed to be removed. This is a significant contributor to the increase in, in, the, in the query rate in medical image clinical trials. So it's getting to the point where a lot of core labs, a lot of groups, just you know, you, you, get to, you, you can't even issue a query past this because it's happening so much. They're just ignoring it and, and moving forward. So it's a big, big problem in the industry. And ultimately, it's number four, it leads to a big compliance risk. So the de-identification of images is a big problem. And it's not just DICOM data. It's data that's burned into the pixel. So very common um, in echocardiograms, for example, you may have the patient information that's actually burned into the image. So it's not part of the structured data where it's being removed, it's actually burned into the image. So, and that's something where hospitals and sites usually don't at all have a capability to do. They can remove sometimes the DICOM data um, that contains PHI, but not always the burned in pixel data. So you need to have a masking function for that. Headache number four, image quality and protocol issues. So core labs and zeros are working with sponsors when they're designing a trial. And one of the things that specifically the core the imaging core labs work with sponsors on is designing an image protocol. How are the images going to be acquired? How do they need to be acquired um, or the exam performed at the hospital or the imaging center so that a proper assessment can be done? So they design an image protocol. Now, images are being submitted into a clinical trial environment that don't always meet that predefined protocol. Very, very, uh, you know, for, for some therapeutic areas, and Dr. Ford alluded to this during his presentation, it's, it's, it's very common you know, that the protocol was not followed. And certain things like slice thickness and, and others, um, you know, even the wrong modality, the wrong dates, the wrong procedures for the patients and so on um, can occur. Um, so one of the big issues with in clinical is just the frequency that protocols are not followed and what can be done to, you know, eliminate that. And then finally, headache number five that we're hearing um, a lot, it's a growing now from the industry, is where is my data? You know, I work with uh, multiple core labs, maybe one core lab for one therapeutic area, one core lab for another therapeutic area, or even multiple core labs across the same therapeutic area. You have a lot of different trials. Oftentimes, your data is in a lot of different systems when you're working with different core labs. Core lab A can use system A, core lab B develop their own, core lab C develop their own, and so on. So while you may have standardized other clinical systems onto a single platform, your imaging data is now spread out across these um, disparate systems that are offered by the core labs. Um, we also hear a lot that the, the, the data that's, you know, the, the system that my core lab is using is not integrated with my EBC. So I'm using one standard EDC, but there's no integration between that. So my sites, for example, when they're, you know, entering data into the EDC, need to manually create a subject in the imaging system before they can submit data. Again, just that manual 
data entry and you know, just more of an opportunity for, uh, for errors and, and increasing that query rate. Minimal visibility. Sponsors would say with Core, we hear a lot, hey, with Core Lab A, I don't have any visibility to the energy activity. Core Lab B, yeah, we get to log in and see some stuff. Core Lab C, it's great. Core Lab D, and so on. So we hear a lot from sponsors. We want one system to have, you know, maximum visibility into all of the energy activities. And then finally, where is data after the trial ends? That's what, what, what happens with that data? Is the sponsor going to archive that? Is the sponsor going to aggregate that into an image repository or an image library? Uh, when it's spread out across multiple systems, how do they get access to that? How do they get the data back? That's one of the things that we're hearing more and more on a, on a daily basis. So with that being said, looking at the, the five uh, the different headaches, um, before I begin and kind of dive into some of the solutions and some of the things that we do to to help uh, eliminate those. So talk about the, the query rate. Um, all those things kind of build up really <laughs> increase the query rate. And it's oftentimes for medical image based trials, 35% or higher. Um, and to be totally honest, it, it could be much higher than that if in fact the identification, uh, when the identification was not done, was ultimately resulting in the query every single time. Uh, as I mentioned before, we hear from some that it's just to the point where you gotta ignore some of it that the core labs are telling us the frequency is just too high. Um, and some therapeutic areas, you know, also force that query rate to be much higher. So we can all look at this and agree that that's, that's completely, you know, unacceptable and something that we should work to, to drive downward. So what's the ideal solution? So when we look at uh, the ideal solution, when we look at, you know, what we feel is the ideal solution in metadata medical imaging, we're going to kind of go through some of the concepts and some pieces of the technology that really helps drive that, that query rate down. First and foremost, you know, we, we've got to make it more wizard-like. We've got to eliminate points where people are just filling out forms. You know, the, the days of systems that just pop up a form and you fill out, hi, I'm from site 001, this is for subject 056, and this is for, you know, this, that filling out the form to submit data is just a, a very antiquated way. It's more structured. As you can see here, as you log on, you click and you choose your trial. That's all. We already know what trials you're part of. We already know what you're enrolled in, so you never have to put in a trial ID. We already know what site you're from. You shouldn't have to manually put in a, a site ID. That's just going to you know, further um, contribute to opportunities for, for error. Once you select your trial, hey, your subjects are already there. They're automatically set you know, from the EDC or other systems. So you would click on your subjects. You can just kind of see the point here. That, and it continues on in the process. We already know the visit schedule, so you don't have to type in whether it's a six week, a six month, a one year, whatever the interval is. Very, very wizard-like in our approach. And again, that that level of, of structure just really helps to, to eliminate data entry errors. Um, yes, we still have electronic forms. We'll take a look at that later. Those are things that clinical data are the things that uh, additional data that you need to collect. But to get to the point to even submit images to, you know, to have to type in your trial ID, your subject ID, your site ID, all those different things is uh, something we really work to eliminate. The idea solution must automatically be identified in the images. So that should not be an option for sites. That should not be something where they have to check to indicate they want it done. Frankly, they shouldn't, you know, just have it done behind the scenes and uh, make it the same, make the de-identification occur the same way every single time. So with metadata medical imaging, that's exactly what we do. Based upon the structure of the trial, we know exactly how to de-identify the images, and we're going to de-identify the images before they leave the site every single time the same way. So that's a very, very important thing is the standardized de-identification. You should not have to worry about that hey, with this system it's done sometimes, with this system it's done you know, three quarters of the time with the system it's not done at all. Standardized the identification so you know it's being done the same way every single time. The ideal solutions would also include electronic forms. So I mentioned that before where we're eliminating filling out forms to get to, um, you know, for things like subject ID, site ID, trial ID, all those different things. Um, and those are more kind of the common things that would have appeared on an image transmittal form or the old concept of an, of an IDF. But we still have electronic forms for other clinical data that needs to be captured. And that goes back to the pain points I mentioned before. We've got to do edit checks on that. So if all of the form fields is here when it's on paper, of course, you can't do edit checks, but electronically, you know, if one form field needed to be within a certain range, I did an edit check for that. If somebody indicated that there was a 75 centimeter aortic aneurysm, we know that's wrong. You know, so let's put ranges and values to control some of the data that's going in to eliminate 
things, even just you know, dates, you know, if you're indicating a visit date or something. Let's do the edit checks in real time. Just make sure as soon as somebody enters a certain value that we can do an edit check, you know, right at that time and not after the fact. Especially on longer forms, you don't want them to have to go back to to field number two. Um, they've you know gone through a whole form. Just do it right in real time. Um, the ideal solution needs to distribute images to wherever they need to go, you know, especially for trials where there's multiple imaging modalities being used. I think in this example, we're talking about a group device trial where the sponsor may have contracted with different core labs based upon you know the modality that's um, being assessed. Sites should not have to think about where things need to go, and they should be able to do it in one submission. Um, but making the medical imaging, when tech, when images are submitted, we just you know look at the modality and know exactly where to route that. You, know, you may be using Core Lab A for CT exams and Core Lab B for MRIs and so on, so that the data needs to get to the right person. And the site should not have to. It's not always Core Labs, though. Oftentimes, it's individual assessors, and the platform needs to be able to support that. They put these this exam into a pool of users that are spread around the globe, and you know, and uh, mark the task complete once two of them review it. And after two of them review it, you know, compare question number nine, and if they're off by more than twenty percent, queue it up a task for somebody else to review it. So it's that distribution of tasks and workflow, um, even with individual assessors or physicians that you have you know, reviewing images. It's always just uh, core labs that they're being distributed to. So the ideal solution must must support that. And on that note, you know, we, we talked a lot about visibility and, and to data before is one of the big pain points. Um, this is kind of snapshot of how it currently looks in the industry, where a sponsor may have standardized their EDC or their GIF or the CPNS platform, you know, on one particular uh, you know platform. But then when they're contracting with different core labs and CROs, the imaging system is being used. Um, so that just speaks to you know just the, the visibility into data and the silos of data that, that may occur um, in the industry. And what we're really you know pushing for, to be honest, what sponsors are really asking for, is a huge drive in the industry right now towards a standardized platform, one solution you know, that kind of um, covers all of the clinical needs for a particular clinical trial. And this is where the the industry is going with imaging is bringing the medical imaging technology back to the sponsor level. Just the, just the technology, letting them contract with their core labs they want, but using their technology platforms. So everything's standardized for the sponsor on one medical image management platform, and they can still work with the core labs that they know and that they love of um, you know, working with, you know, for their, and again, however those key decisions are made, clinical expertise, therapeutic expertise, and so on. So just trying to eliminate the core lab specific technology solutions so that sponsors can continue to adopt this unified, you know, single platform that, that everyone's looking for in the industry now. And finally, the, uh, or perhaps not final, but the ideal solution, you know, needs to have image and get tools for everybody. Um, so, you know, sponsors, another thing that we hear sponsors asking for a lot now are, hey, we, we want to look at the images during the trial, too. We don't want to interrupt or participate in the clinical trial or be part of that at all. Let that naturally progress in the structured way that's designed for the trial. But, you know, perhaps when, XYZ type event occurs, you have a task for our chief medical officer to, to also take a look. So viewing, we need to have flexible viewing tools, whether that's on mobile devices, um, you know, quick glance, or should have always stall large amounts of technology. It needs to be simple and easy to, uh, to go in um, viewing tools. So we have viewing tools for core labs as well. Oftentimes, core labs have their own you know, viewing and assessment tools, so no problem. We just get the images and insert them right into those um, viewing environments. We can continue on in their process um, using viewing tools or assessment tools that they've designed to, to you know, to, um, to assess the images. But again, the key here is we need to have viewing tools for everybody that's part of the trial just to make sure that if appropriate, doesn't mean they always have access, but if, if they need to have access, they have the right tool to view the images. Electronic CRS. Big part. So sponsors, you know, or core labs now, um, for many years, they're entering data directly back into electronic CRS or, or, or forms that are provided by the EDCs. And really, what we're doing now is giving the opportunity to let's, let's marry the image with the, the clinical data. So, why not, in, in a form that's being filled out for a measurement, why not also include a snapshot of the measurement that was made? So 
that's what we give the opportunity to do is to kind of marry the clinical data that's being collected with the actual medical images that were used to make that assessment. So that's something that's becoming much more popular, as Dr. Ford spoke about earlier, and I'll call you track. That's an area where they really want to have. I want to actually see the assessment. I want to see the measurement that was made and, and kind of include that as part of, part of the assessment form that was filled out. So the ideal solution, perhaps this isn't needed now, but the ideal solution needs to at least support that that path, uh, you know, because things are definitely heading in that direction. So kind of looking at data before we looked at the uh, the top five key points that we were, you know, seeing in the industry, and then got to the um, some solutions that we have to help eliminate those. And ultimately, we're trying to drive down the query rate. Our query rate on our technology now is less than seven percent. And it's only getting uh, lower as uh, more integration with uh, EDC, you know, with, uh, with RAVE, and, and um, other many data solutions occurs. So that, that query rate is definitely going down. You can see that significant drop in, in query rate from what the industry kind of sees as a, as a whole to uh, you know what we're doing. I think one of the biggest contributors to that is our structured approach to image submission, as well as the automated de-identification. So no queries have to go back for images that were not de-identified. So in summary, you know, if you are still shipping images, and believe it or not, it still does happen. Uh, you know, it's much less expensive than shipping. Uh, Real-time data visibility to access to sponsors, really everybody involved, CROs, core labs, and so on. Extremely secure and compliant. And then finally, real-time collaboration. Any questions uh, following this presentation, you, know, you can visit Dr. Uh, Robert Ford's website at cpicon.com, as well as the MediData website where, um, and visit the medical imaging section and page where we have a microsite that also explains the story and explains a lot of these capabilities much further. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate the presentation. We have one question for you. How large are the image files and how how large are the image files and how are the sites uploading the images to the system? Excellent question. Image files can range in size. So there are uh, X-rays can be you know one particular size. CT scans can be a totally you know, totally different size. So really, there's a huge variance in the size of the images. But more importantly than that, there's a huge variance in the number of images. So we'll use CT as an example, just tying it back to Dr. Ford's presentation earlier for oncology. CT um, image files are typically about a half a meg, so very small per slice. However, one particular CT scan can have thousands of images, so you can see the variance there. With metadata medical imaging technology, so it doesn't really matter the size of that. Um, as we upload the data in the background, so we're not tying up the user's workstation as it occurs. And especially for OUS, uh, you know, regions like Australia and so on, if the internet connection is dropped or lost, our technology is automatically going to a pause state and retry and continue on in the process as soon as the connection is back. So if for larger data sets, where we see the largest data sets typically with um, echocardiograms, um, this ensures that the data is going to get there. Um, if it, you know, if the connection is dropped OUS, it's going to reestablish it. Um, but you can just rest assured that the data, that the data is going to get there. Thank you, Dan. The final question is for Dr. Ford. Is central imaging analysis required for phase two or three pivotal studies? What percent of, the, of such studies using central core lab for submission on endpoint analysis? Um, I, I don't think that um, that central review is absolutely required if you can, for phase two and three studies, if you can assure that your trial is completely blinded. If, if, if you have any concern about the blinding and bias on the part of the site, uh, then you might consider central review. Um, there's also another methodology, uh, it's called the audit method, where you can do statistical analyses. There are several different audit methods where you can do a statistical analysis on a subgroup of subjects to see if there is any site-related bias. 
Um, and if there is site-related bias, then you would need to go on to a, a complete independent review. Um, that is one proposal that had some, um, some support several years ago uh, that was proposed by the Progression Free Survival Working Group. Um, so that is another potential opportunity, and there are several different um, audit methods that were proposed by various groups. And um, I, I could give you information as to where, where those methods are published. Um, but I would say it's, it's not always uh, recommended or required. Uh, but if you have any concern about bias or uh, the study not being totally blinded, uh, then independent review um, would likely be very important. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Mm -hmm. That concludes the best practices in the use of medical images in the clinical trials webinar. I apologize for the technical challenges and want to thank our presenters, Dr. Ford and Dan Braga, for their time and insightful presentations.